Like all the presenters in today's session, I'm going to be talking about um, old objects that get deposited in slightly newer contexts. Um, and also uh, what it meant for objects to become old in the Iron Age. I'll be looking at what we might call heirloom objects from middle to late Iron Age East Yorkshire in Northern England with other examples <coughs> from elsewhere in Britain. Um, though as I'll discuss, there might be other appropriate names for these objects as well. I'll be focusing first on the processes that these objects went through during their long lives, um, looking at how they became old, how they became heirlooms, um, and, and how they acquired value over time, concentrating on the possibility that some of these objects were deliberately fragmented and reassembled. Finally, I'll, I'll look briefly at the act of actually depositing these objects to see if I can contribute to <coughs> arguments about why, um, why these old and valuable objects were deposited when they were. The idea that some, uh, some Iron Age objects were old and well used when they were deposited is not new. Uh, the Kirkburn sword, uh, shown here, from East Yorkshire, is one of the, the most iconic Iron Age objects in Britain, um, and it's a famous example of an object with a long history. Even before it was first assembled, it was, uh, its components were numerous, and they would have taken uh, time to procure and produce and put together. Um, it's been very well used, um, damaged and repaired several times, which I'll talk about a bit more later. Um, the sword was then buried um, within the grave of a very, a very young man, um, aged only 17 to 25, along with uh, several other objects, including spearheads and a really cool um, male shirt. The sword um, has been much discussed as an object that condensed history, um, and that by the time of burial might have been older than all of those present, uh, representing an earlier time, or representing the past in the past. Other famous old objects from Iron Age Britain include the grotesque talk up there, um, which is great. Uh, Jody Joy talked a little bit about that yesterday. Um, it's, it's seen a lot of wear, and again, it's been repaired um, on several separate occasions, so it's you know really been well used. Um, and cauldrons are also <coughs> very good examples of much repaired Iron Age objects. And again, I've borrowed this really good quote from, from Jody there. In the title of this talk, um, I've used the word heirloom to refer to old objects. Um, but actually, this word does carry um, specific connotations relating to objects owned within families. Um, so whilst kinship might have been an important um, sort of aspect of the way objects were passed between people um, in the Iron Age, it's also possible that other more complex form of, uh, forms of ownership, uh, like communal ownership, were perhaps in play as well. I also found um, the word antique might be better for the objects I'm looking at um, because it relates to value derived from oldness. Um, and this is something I'm going to kind of mention again um, later. And it's something that I think might apply to old Iron Age objects. For the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about some research I've recently been doing on old Iron Age objects, um, looking at use, wear, repair, and modification. The study I've carried out is the type of study often, often known as the study of object biographies. Um, however, recent years have seen a kind of um, slight, like growing dissatisfaction amongst archaeologists with this term, um, due to the notion that um, the idea of objects having lives makes their existences kind of artificially linear. Um, object continuities were put, have been put, put forward as a sort of alternative to biographies to make them less kind of human um, and sort of see objects in time and space. Um, but I think maybe our uh, itineraries are also pretty linear as well. Um, Jones, uh, Diaz Gardamino, and Quellen have recently um, gone a bit further than this when discussing uh, decorated Neolithic slate plaques. Um, with each separate episode of decoration, um, they argue, each slate plaque becomes um, a different object, and they've turned this um, sort of idea of multiple objects. So I'm currently sort of thinking about this idea in my assemblage. Um, but because lots of my objects are composite objects, uh, the term multiple objects kind of takes on an, another level of meaning there as well. Uh, my recent PhD research looked at a varied assemblage of objects from middle to late Iron Age East Yorkshire in order to examine the functions of different types of decoration in different spheres of activity. And part of this work entailed a study of the use, damage, repair and modification of three groups of objects, scabbards, chariot fittings and bone objects. Um, and this study kind of allowed me to build 
on um, existing work by archaeologists, and Mel Jars in particular, um, and place objects like the Kirkburn sword into a wider context, um, and show that the curation and modification of objects in particular ways was widespread in this region. I'm just going to whiz through some of my findings, um, focusing on composite objects today, um, and um, I'll be looking at some comparative examples from elsewhere as well. So um, the first kind of thing to note is that um, like most of the objects I looked at um, had been really well used. So here are some examples of the wear I found on chariot fittings in my assemblage. So pointer, yay. Um, so <laughs> up here on these bridle bits, you can see they're really worn down. Um, this, this ring ring or turret has been kind of distorted. Um, down here, this is a, an antler linchpin, which has got some wear facets on. And again, wear here. So this is something that was really common in my assemblage. Um, this particular ring ring, um, it's been noted already by J.D. Hill that, um, that the, the coral bead here uh, fell out and it's been replaced by a blob of red glass there. So um, it's kind of been in use long enough to break and be repaired. Um, scabbards um, were also very often repaired. Um, so the, this is the Kirkburn sword again. Um, and you can see in this x-ray really clearly where um, there's a big, been a big break in the front plate and it's, it's been repaired there. Um, but here's another nice example of repair that I found um, within the South Cave weapons cache. Um, so that's a really nice one. Um, and here are some other repaired objects from Brit elsewhere in Britain. Um, I've already mentioned this one, but there's another talk from Snettersham here. Um, Cauldron repairs again. And this bracelet actually from France, um, which has got a nice repair here. Um, brooches are sometimes repaired as well. Here's one from Dorset. And another scabbard repair as well. Um, arguably, um, the repairs that I found in, in my assemblage were, um, were notable in how undisguised they were. Um, and they were carried out in a very different kind of style of working um, to the original craftsmanship. And this one was even decorative in itself, which is lovely. Um, decorative repairs are something that, um, that also happens elsewhere in Britain in the Iron Age. Um, this example um, is from the Chisholm Cauldron, um, and, and it's uh, one of the Chisholm Cauldron, and it's been repaired with lovely um, scalloped patches, um, which probably would have looked quite striking. And it was when they were new. Returning back to East Yorkshire again, um, comments have been made before about the mismatched aesthetics of some sets of chariot fittings, um, which contrast with other quite matching sets. Um, and it's also notable that several chariots from uh, chariot burials have really conspicuous replacement wheels as well. So um, the entire wheel has been replaced sometimes on chariots. It's been suggested um, that one particular chariot from a burial um, at Ferry Friston was assembled only for its final journey into the grave from a variety of components um, or maybe from different communities or areas. Um, and I, I've kind of argued this is true for other chariots as well. Uh, here's a similar, a similar phenomenon I found with the garden uh, turrets of the Garden Station chariot burial. Um, the fifth larger uh, turret just here is really, really different from the other four. Um, in both the way it's constructed and the way it's um, been designed as well, aesthetically. Scabbards from the, the South Cave weapons cache um, are um, notably made from a mixture of old and new components. Um, old styles of component have been fitted onto newer styles of object. Um, and although dating um, these components purely by style is sometimes problematic, um, metallurgical analysis has also indicated that, um, that this difference in date is, is, is the case. Perhaps um, my, my favourite object that I looked at is this one, the Broomthorpe Shield. Um, the, the interesting thing about it is that um, these two crescent-shaped plaques um, had been really, really well worn. They'd, um, they'd got dents in, they had little tears in, which had been repaired <coughs> as well. Um, and they also had loads and loads of rivet holes of lots of different shapes and sizes all around the edges, um, showing that they'd been um, nailed to multiple different backings over time. Um, and Roland Williamson um, gave me some help with this, actually, and he suggested that um, 
the, the, the shapes of the holes showed that actually the fittings had been like ripped off at some point from their backing and then attached onto a new one. Um, so interestingly, um, although these present ones are really well used, um, the other ones are pretty much pristine. Um, so there's a real contrast in the amount of wear there. Um, and I, so what I've suggested with the Grimthorpe shield is that um, its components have been brought together from a range of different sources and kind of made into this um, interesting composite object. Um, and this is something we find um, on other East Yorkshire objects. Um, the Danesgrave pin, uh, studied by Mel Giles, um, the coral beads there originally came from a necklace and they've been fitted onto this pin as decoration. Uh, sets of beads may have been brought together over time from different sources. Um, and just a an example from Scotland as well, the Tors pony cap um, yeah. had these lovely horns kind of added on at some point, and they're thought to have originally been <coughs> um, fittings from the yoke of a chariot. So that's a real kind of mishmash of uh, different bits there. Um, I also noted um, an accumulation of decoration um, on some objects. Um, it's already been noted on the Kirkbone scabbard, where the bottom section is very differently decorated to the top section. And I kind of found it on the wet one three sword as well, um, where this kind of wibbly wobbly decoration was added, um, possibly added to the scabbard um, at a different time from this very confident um, original decoration. Or maybe it was added before, I don't know. Um, and this is something, um, again, noted elsewhere in Britain, the accumulation of decoration over time. Um, these turrets are particularly nice, um, looked at by Mary Davis. Um, and she's argued that these um, little cells filled with enamel were kind of added um, at some point in, uh, in the turret's life. Um, they weren't cast in, as you might expect. Back to the Grimthorpe shield again. Um, as well as different degrees of wear um, on the fittings, uh, their decorative styles also really, um, really contrast with each other as well. And I've argued that Maybe this is a deliberate um, juxtaposition of different styles of decoration to create kind of a, a patchwork object. So my examination of composite objects from East Yorkshire has suggested that they were generally well used, um, potentially over quite long periods of time. They were damaged um, and repaired along their useful lives, and repairs were emphasised. Uh, some were made from a mixture of old and new components, and components were sometimes uh, contrasted or juxtaposed against each other to emphasise um, their sort of varied origins. Um, I argue that objects with visible stories were important in materialising Iron Age histories and conceptual, uh, conceptualising the past in the past. And I suggest that perhaps some of the composite objects I've looked at were deliberately fragmented and their components reassembled in different ways um, as part of the process of making old objects with interesting stories. So these are, I think, antique objects, objects that gain value partly by being old. They've been carefully curated, potentially over long periods, making their eventual deposition, um, I think, probably quite significant. This talk so far has been all about objects, and I just wanted to very quickly kind of end by considering what caused these valuable um, antique or heirloom objects to be deposited um, when they were. Almost all the composite objects I examined from East Yorkshire were excavated from uh, graves associated with large cemeteries. Um, and the presence of these types of objects um, in graves is very rare in Britain due to the general lack of, um, sort of recognised or standard Iron Age burials in Britain. Um, and it's also extremely useful to us because it allows um, objects like the ones I've just been showing to be linked directly to in individual people. So that's really useful. Um, Mel Giles has noted uh, during a study of, um, of brave goods, uh, all sorts of things like pots and brooches and tools from Iron Age East Yorkshire, that the overall number of objects um, uh, present in graves increases along with the age of the deceased. So old people <coughs> have more things than young people. Um, yeah. <laughs> and very young people don't really get anything. Um, <laughs> And so as people grow older, um, forming relations with increasing uh, numbers of um, things and people and fulfilling rites of passage, um, the assemblage of objects around them also grows. And this isn't necessarily about ownership, um, but about kind of affiliation with, with different objects. Um, I think that the much 
uh, rarer composite metal objects that I've been looking at today, like swords and shields, um, perhaps don't work in quite the same way as these other more common types of grave goods. I've already mentioned that the Kirkburn sword was an old object found within the grave of a very young man. Um, and this, I've just kind of put together this table of the, um, the ages of, um, of the people buried with the objects I've just been looking at, where the ages are known. Um, sometimes, uh, some of them, we don't know how old the person was because uh, they're antiquarian discoveries. Um, these graves all kind of contain multiple other, t uh, other objects as well. Um, and as you can see, um, the ages of the individuals like, vary quite a lot, but with a, a slight bias towards the young. Um, this suggests different relations between objects and people. Um, affiliations with these composite metal objects, it seems, weren't built over time like the more ubiquitous types of, of grave goods that Giles looked at. Um, and of course, it's possible that these people were special in some way. Um, they achieved something particular that meant they got this object buried with them. But it's my feeling that the deposition of, of uh, these objects in graves wasn't necessarily about the deceased. Um, after all, the burial of the dead is something choreographed by the community around them. Um, but maybe it was about the objects themselves um, and about these important objects continuing their roles. So, um, sort of to conclude, because um, I can, I can it, have I run out of time? Yeah. Oh, cool. Keep going, keep talking. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so, to conclude, this is all a work in progress, really. Um, and um, my next kind of aims are really to um, extend the study of um, the, the biographies, if you like, of, of objects like this um, outside of East Yorkshire across a wider geographical area to see how far this stretches. Um, and I'd also love to try and um, sort of, uh, you know, link it into um, recent radiocarbon <coughs> dating, maybe do some experimental use wear analysis. Um, so yeah, to conclude really, there's lots still for me to do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>